Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. I'm here with Lisa Simpson. Lisa, it's December 15th, 2022. Uh, we've been at this now. Uh, the, these town halls for, for three years. So we're closing out another year with our town hall community. It's amazing, Eric. And um, I just want to thank everyone that's been part of our town hall audience. I've had such a great time um, getting to connect with you. And some of you I've even had the chance to meet in real life, which is super exciting. Um, I, I can't believe we've been at this for, for almost three years, but it's been um, an absolute pleasure to get to do this. Absolutely. We look forward to this every couple of weeks. Once again, Lisa, we've, we're going to be bringing the latest information, the best available information we have. We'll be interpreting it and talking about strategies and capabilities. We've got another power hour in store. So let's look at today's agenda. We're going to kick things off with an economic update with Marcy Russell, a regular here uh, on town halls. We're then going to have Mark Peterson uh, providing us the latest uh, from what's happening in Washington, D.C. as we end the, the the final sessions of Congress before the new Congress comes in in January of 23. Lisa then will be giving you uh, an update on the 1099Ks and many other technical uh, uh, hot items. And then we're going to close today's discussion out with a leader from Robert Half talking about the current state of hiring in the accounting in finance market. So Lisa, here's our lineup. I look forward to being back with you momentarily. Uh, now I'd like to bring up uh, Marcy Russell. Uh, you all know Marcy. Marcy, it's great to see you. So good, Mar good to have you. So, you know, this is our, this is the Squawk Box uh, for the profession. Uh, you were the, one of the original co-hosts of the Squawk Box. We've got a lot to talk about, so we're going to get right into it. And what we have here on this slide uh, is the news of the last 24 hours. The big Fed hike that occurred, it, it, it was what was expected. Um, but here, the title here uh, of uh, Chairman Powell's grim inflation outlook is at odds with markets. And then his quote here. I wish there was a completely painless way to restore price stability, he said yesterday, but there isn't. And I think the markets are feeling that pain today, Marcy. Well, that's absolutely true. And we have to remember that Jerome Powell finds himself in a really um, uncomfortable position for a modern central banker. Because ever since the 1970s, it's been recognized that central bank credibility the public's willingness to believe the central bank when they say we're going to keep inflation under control is critical for long-term price stability. Because if I don't think prices will be stable, then it will change the way that people behave. And so we don't want anyone to ever do that. We don't want people to change the way they behave. And so part of that is the central bank, we must believe them and their ability to combat inflation. Well, we all know that over the last two years, in the wake of the pandemic, with all the stimulus money, with the shocks to energy prices and food prices that came from the war in Ukraine, inflation levels year over year were much higher than what the Federal Reserve was expecting and what they had told us they were going to expect. So because their credibility is on the line at this point, the chairman of the Federal Reserve finds himself having to be really sort of um, emphasize that we take this inflation series. So it's almost, I, I liken it to, you know, I have um, kids, right? And when my kids were little, um, I used to sort of put on my really stern face when I wanted them to behave, you know, better be good or I'm going to X, Y, Z. And um, of course, I never actually did X, Y, Z because my mean, stern face kept them from doing what would have made me have to do X, Y, Z. And I think that that's where Powell is right now. He's having to sternly say, hey, don't think we're going to back off 
just because we went from 75 basis points to 50 points, right? But at the end of the day, the terminal rate still expected to be 5%, which Eric, what that means is that by the third quarter, or excuse me, by the second quarter of next year, Federal Reserve will have stopped raising rates. And history shows, based on notice this little um, right. chart, that once they get to an, a, a rate high peak, they usually pretty quickly start to bring rates down. So it wouldn't surprise me to see the Federal Reserve lowering rates um, in the spring of next year. Even though Powell has said, you know, don't think I'm going to do that, we might be really surprised by that point. Well, well, thanks, Marcy. And just one thing, there's a just check if you, is anything you can do, check the audio. To, 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 there's a little bit of crackling uh, okay. that we've got some feedback really in it. Here. So you may move forward. Thank you very much. Sure, so sure. if you look at the chart here, then we can take the chart down after we kind of do a little bit more analysis. But you look at it's almost like a, it's a it's a steep, steep climb that occurred over the past many months this year related to the rate hikes. Then you look at the progression of rate hikes um, in 2011 to about about 15 or 16 there. And we could have done this chart all the way back to 2001 and two. So, you know, when you look in, you know, in, in a historical perspective, you know, is this, is this just extreme what's occurring with the Fed? Well, I think the post pandemic environment was certainly extreme in that the Federal Reserve wasn't raising rates just to get back to sort of normal economic policy. Uh, they were raising rates in the face of the highest inflation they had seen in 40 years. So, by the way, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great, great, great. So you're just going to have to see my face really close. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they, they were raising rates in response to the highest inflation they had seen in 40 years. So if you think back to the last time we were post-recession, the Fed was raising rates in 2010, 2011, and 2012, right? So that's on that chart right there. And they raised rates in really you know small increments. That was the midst of the jobless recovery. So if you recall back during that time, even though they were raising rates, labor markets were really, really weak. So they were moving in a very gingerly fashion because inflation at that point wasn't out of control and labor markets were very, very weak. Contrast that to today where labor markets are super strong and they've got to get inflation under control. So it's really apples to oranges. You can't really draw any conclusions from what they're doing today based on the experience of the last time we saw rates go up, which was 2011, 2012, 2013. So Marcy, some comments coming in saying, well, it's clearly not transitory uh, inflation. <laughs> Where do you see inflation going in 2023. So now we've, we've talked about what the Fed's trying to do and, and, and Powell's trying to show you that he's a serious poker player and he's not bluffing. But what, where do you see? Are we, and you, you talked very candidly about this a year ago, and this was before the geopolitical crisis. You said it looked like the supply chain was working itself out and that inflation would, would tamper down. Then we had Ukraine and, and, and obviously that did not occur. Where do you see us going in 2023? Well, I think if you look historically, Ukraine simply delayed peak inflation. So it's likely inflation would have peaked in February of last year had it not been for the invasion of Ukraine that drove up food prices and energy prices. So now we know inflation peaked in June of last year um, and it peaked at over 9 percent. Since that time, it's come down slowly, steadily. Um, we are now at 7%, right? So we've come down 200 basis points in about a five-month period of time. Um, if it continues on that trend, then in another five months, inflation will be at 5%. But I suspect that given the fact that energy prices are no longer going up, they appear to have stabilized, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the worst of the shock from Ukraine has been digested by the world. We also know that the stimulus money that was sort of boosting household spending last year is pretty much tapped out at least for folks who are sort of in the bottom half of the income distribution. Um, we know that credit card balances are up. We know that consumers are really starting to feel the strain of inflation. 
and changing their behavior as a result. So when people start to change their behavior, they put off purchases, they stop you know, shopping for expensive groceries and move to shifting over to less expensive groceries. All those things began to put some real downward pressure on prices. So when I look, I see, I, I'm, I can't see any forces that would continue to drive up inflation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, everything suggests that the push to push prices down is pretty strong, um, given that I have to believe that supply and demand still work. That as mm -hmm. the consumer gets weaker and weaker and weaker and demand drops off, and we saw that in retail sales numbers, we know that businesses are discounting heavily going into the holiday season, which is exactly the opposite of what they were doing last year. So Marcy, so this is, so inflation peaked in, peaked in June over the summer, looks like it's, it's, it's heading down um, in, in the coming months. How, what kind of landing are we going to have? So, I mean, you and I were talking before the before we got on. There's pain out there. There's pain. I, I have a, a, a family member who works in the, you know, selling cars. He's like, nobody's going. Some days they have no one coming to the showroom. So that's that's not that's not good for car sales. There's a lot of other people that are impacted by uh, the car sales market. So it's, it's un, it, are we? Is this going to get really hard? Is it going to get really hard for? a lot of uh, for the economy and are we going to go into a recession well a lot of folks are worried about a hard landing and we only really have one um historical instance where rising interest rates resulted in a hard landing that we can sort of mm -hmm. you know look and say well it's kind of like this and that was 1981 1982. Mm -hmm. the main difference between paul volcker who raised the fed funds target rate not to five percent but to 15%, basically. Mm -hmm. So, and, and he did that because inflation had been a problem in the economy, not for 10 months, for 10 years. Wow. So under those circumstances, yeah, you get a hard landing. Um, I can't really get into the hard landing camp simply because I only have one historical example of it. And the situation was so much worse uh, then than it is today. Now, that doesn't mean that the most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy aren't feeling some real pain. Housing, number one, we know that activity there is has sort of fallen off a cliff. Now, to put it into perspective, a year ago, housing transactions were at an all time high. So you're coming off of all time highs um, to a rate that's much lower. And I think basically what happened is because people are forward looking, they do look out and say, I'm expecting interest rates to go up. So I better lock that mortgage rate in now, which means that a lot of activity that would have normally happened this year got backed up into last year. So you had basically three years worth of housing activity squished into two years. I think the same thing is happening in the sectors, particularly auto. Um, given where rates are right now, given that people aren't expecting this to be permanent, they basically go, eh, I could buy a new car now, but why don't I wait three or four months, see if I can just get by with what I've got until rates come back down. So one way to interpret, um, given that people still have jobs, given that incomes are going up, given that they're still spending, that travel spending is back to where it was pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of service sector spending is recovering quickly at a time when goods are sort of softening, but it's possible that that's simply people being sort of forward looking and saying, why would I sort of buy, take out a car loan now at these interest rates when I know three months, four months, five months, they're going to be lower. Mortgage rates have been down right. for the last five weeks. So I think the worst of those rates are behind us. And it doesn't mean they get cheap anytime soon. But I do think the worst is in the rearview mirror for those types of things. So real quickly, a bunch of people saying, OK, recession, no recession um, and labor market. So this sure. it's going to so things everyone's pushing. If everybody you, know, you saw the retail numbers that came out. So things are beginning to decline what's what's the your percent likelihood of a recession um well actually you know recession of course is everywhere right now except in the numbers um it is true that retail sales were soft and industrial production has been down for one month but you need six months to make it a recession 
So you have to have widespread declines across multiple industries, not just technology, not just um, cryptocurrencies, not just housing. It has to be everywhere. And you also have to have employment decline. So even though the technology sector has laid off, you know, people are anywhere, say 80,000 to 90,000 workers have been laid off in technology. Um, those workers are being quickly reabsorbed into new jobs. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't look like any recession I've ever seen. What it does look like is 2000, 2001, where mm -hmm. the stock market is doing one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And we pay a lot of attention to that. But in some ways, that's divorced from what's happening in the real economy, which is just kind of a slide sideways, which is very different than the last two real recessions we had in 2008, 2009. That was a real decline that took a long time to get out of. And then the COVID-induced recession, which was very severe, but very, very short. All right. Well, that's good perspective for the firms and their clients. It's more, you know, the 2001, 2002 and then it, then it did. It, it, we moved into a, a pretty, pretty good recovery a, a few, few years after that. So talking a little bit more about supply chain, I mean, how do you see the supply chain doing? There's a lot of discussions uh, of, you know, people insuring now. So there's, there's different strategies. It's not just the, the supply chain shortages. Companies are basically rethinking what their supply chain should be. Certainly the word resilience around supply chain, I feel like is supply chain is the real buzzword. And it's coming off of two things. Uh, globalization probably peaked in 2017. Mm -hmm. Well, once you sort of got the trade wars going with China and Europe um, that sort of started under the last administration, but there seems to be plenty of bipartisan support to keep them going. So globalization probably peaked around 2017. The pandemic, the supply chain disruption that happened there, and then the war in Ukraine that are sort of bringing back those old east-west mm -hmm. splits that we thought we kind of put to bed um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, that's all kind of coming back, which brings us to a world where it isn't just in search of the lowest cost labor and the lowest cost production, you have to also layer on top of that kind of an insurance policy that you won't have a disruption to your supply chains. Now, the short term disruption from COVID, which you can see kind of measured in things like the New York Federal Reserve has a supply chain pressure mm -hmm. index that I watch very closely. And I would sort of recommend that to everyone. The New York Federal Reserve um, supply chain pressure index. You can see it went off the charts during COVID, but it's approaching kind of normal levels. So the short-term cyclical supply chain issues that drove inflation, that drove about 40% of the inflation we saw last year, um, those are tamping down. Um, and we now have reports of the environment shifting very quickly and retailers saying we don't even want to hold inventory now, just, mm -hmm. just exactly the opposite of, of last year. So the environment has changed, obviously, very, yeah. very quickly. But you need to separate out that short term supply chain COVID related disruption to, I think, a more geopolitical long term um, reshoring in anticipation of maybe you know, tensions in the South China Sea, um, things like that. And those two things are different, uh, but taking them all together, it's a push again to get production a little closer to home than we would have seen in the last decade. So probably this, this is, for the U.S. market, there could be a number of positives of this where there's a lot a lot more investments. We're seeing that, you know, obviously seeing that in the semiconductor market, but just manufacturing in general. So we're gonna, we're gonna round out with uh, two more quick topics. First, just let your comments on the labor market and then we're about the about the new Congress. So, so labor market first. Sure. Um, if you do have a recession, it's going to be, instead of a jobless recovery, it could be the job full recession. Mm -hmm. If you do have some sort of recession, because labor is still so incredibly scarce, because um, part of it, of course, is escalated retirements, as we've talked about before. So people leaving the workforce earlier because of COVID, but also 
the younger generation demographically, it's just a much smaller pool than all of those millennials who flooded into markets in 2008, 2009, 2010, that gave us the sense that labor was plentiful. Um, when in fact, demographically, the U.S. is facing the same issues that Europe is facing, not enough young people to replace old people as they retire, or I shouldn't call old people retiring because that's getting me too close to me. So we'll just say more senior folks, right? Mm -hmm. So labor force being squeezed on both ends demographically, um, an immigration quagmire so that we can't seem to sort of figure out how to, you know, bring in skilled workers or even unskilled workers to do construction jobs. That's sort of eluding us politically right now, which means that you have a situation where we could go the way of Japan or Europe, where economically the economy moves up and down, growth moves up and down, but you, you maintain a pretty low unemployment rate overall for more demographic reasons than anything else. Well, we're going to be talking about that. I mean, there's 10 million openings, a four million people on unemployment. So we, we got a ways to go to fill all of those uh, job openings. So finally, we're going to bring Mark Peterson up. We're going to be talking about D.C. from an economic standpoint. Uh, what, how does this, uh, you know, here, welcome, Mark. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about uh, the, the new Congress uh, that's coming in and what, what you see for the, ne the next two years related to uh, economic influence? Marcy, we lost you. Did, guys, we didn't, we, we didn't drop Marcy yet. That was for Marcy. Thank you. So that was great. Okay, well, I'll make it quick because Mark actually knows more about this than I do. I will just say that it seems as if we find ourselves back in that spot where Congress, second half of um, a president's administration, Congress moves the other direction, and it means that we go from sort of being – a legislative driven economy to an executive order driven economy, which um, from a, from a sort of long-term stability point of view, I, I just can't get behind. Um, but it seems to be the way that um, the world works now. You know, if they made me queen of the universe, I wouldn't do it that way, but I think that's kind of where we are given sort of divided government, but I'll turn it over to Mark. Cause I bet he's got some ideas. I agree. I agree, Marcy. Hey, so Marcy, just want to, I've got, you know, we got close to 10,000 people that join us every week. We got a lot of comments coming in. A lot of people appreciate how you continue to make sense out of a lot of complexity that's happening in these markets. So thank you. We wish you the best for the remainder of 2022. And we look forward to having you back with the town hall community in 23. Thank you so much, guys. You guys have great holidays and a happy, happy new year. Thank you. Okay, Mark, welcome, welcome. So uh, we've got plenty to talk about. So we'll, we'll, kick, we'll kick things off. When we were in uh, Austin, I'm trying to remember where we were for the, the, la the last digital CPA, but we were at we were last digital CPA, the last town hall. We did live from digital CPA in Austin. Yeah. And Barry was with us on that day, December 6th. There was the Georgia election. So everybody knows what happened in Georgia. Uh, so maybe a comment on that and then a comment on the makeup of the Senate. Yeah, no, again, Georgia wasn't the cliffhanger it's been in the past because uh, Democrat leader Schumer knew he was going to at least have 50 votes, right? Which is what they were enjoying, have enjoyed up to this point. Um, but one vote matters. And so uh, the fact that Senator Warnock is coming back for Senator Schumer means that he's got a little wiggle room. Um, and this is one of the reasons he needs a little wiggle room. As you know, you know, the conversations around Build Back Better went on for months and months. And then we got to the Inflation Reduction Act. But a lot of that was in order to find the votes, the, the 50 votes they needed. And they had two holdouts, Senator Manchin from up until the very end, Senator Manchin from West Virginia and Senator Sinema from Arizona. And she continues to keep things interesting. So, um, she just announced that she's going to switch from the Democratic Party to run as an independent. Um, that feels in some ways like a, a bigger deal than it is practically uh, in Capitol Hill. In order to get your committee assignments, you have to caucus with one of the two parties. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, Angus King from Maine and Bernie Sanders are both independents, but they caucus with the Democrats. So she's going to continue to caucus with the Democrats. She will, it appears that she's going to be maintaining the committee seats that she had. There had been 
um, some discussion about whether maybe the, the Democratic leadership would punish her for leaving by taking away committee assignments. But the problem is, is you also need her vote, Eric. So it's tough to punish somebody when you got to go ask them for favors. So ultimately, it, it does, isn't going to change. She's still going to be a tough vote for the Democrat leadership to get. She has been. That's just the way she has operated. She's operated as an independent even before declaring it. Um, I do think that this seat is up. Uh, I do think it's going to be an, it create some interesting things uh, in Arizona in 2024, where it easily could be a three-way with a Democrat and a Republican, and then Sen Senator Cinema running as well. Well, Mark, uh, our Senator Manchin will come back into play again. I mean, he, he we, 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 I think if we had one slide uh, highlighting Senator Manchin's positions, we had ten over right. the last couple of years on town halls. Yeah, no, when the margins are that close, you got to figure out how to get everybody. So, Mark, well, hey, we've got it, it, they're still they're still working in Washington D.C. Still working. They the year end right. We got through the election, and then, now they've got to uh, get through this lame duck session. Um, things seem to be trending in a productive way. I say that today; it may change tomorrow. Uh, the House, what they're going to do, the government current. Continuing resolution that funds the government runs until tomorrow night, midnight. Then the government will shut down if they don't fix it. What they could do is pass another continuing relation, uh, continuing resolution in order to extend it for any period of time. In this case, it'll be a week. So the House has passed one. Uh, the Senate is taking it up. They both have to pass it. And then they get another week, basically, of grace to get this deal cut. I think it's going to happen. There is a little noise about some Republican opposition, unless they have the ability to amend, to have some amendments in the continuing resolution. If in fact that was negotiated to a deal, it would have to go back to the house in order to get this one week extension. And then they got until midnight to get all that done. I suspect it's gonna pass clean and it will be until the end of next week. So that's number one. Number two, you know, they have been trying to, to narrow this $26 billion gap between the two negotiations of the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, that seems to be getting closer and closer. So they are getting closer to what would be an omnibus solution where they put all the funding into one bill in order to take it through 2023. Uh, that appears to be happening. There is the possibility, though, that there's two other alternatives other than shutdown. They do another short-term CR to get into next year, February, March, something like that. I think they're probably loath to do that, but it's a possibility. Or, and there are some proponents of this, they do a long-term CR, which is basically funding at the current levels for a whole year. Uh, I, the, the Deficit Hawks like that idea because you can't, can't add spending. But if you have programmatic things that you want included that were in these appropriations bills that are being pulled together, you don't like it. I think the most likely outcome is an omnibus. And I think they get it done before they leave for the holidays. Uh, when they start to smell the jet fumes, Eric, mm -hmm. to leave for uh, the holiday, they, deals get cut. The two other things that possibly could get added um, would be retirement legislation. We've talked about it in the past. There's bipartisan retirement uh, package out there with about 70 provisions, good stuff. Um, that is probably number one as far as likelihood of if something atta is attached, retirement legislation. Number two, and this is important to us, is extenders. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still out there as a possibility. We're watching it closely. We're encouraging it. Um, but it is not a done deal at this point. Well, Mark, I mean, I remember in July of this year, we thought the, you know, the, the reconciliation bill wouldn't happen. Then we had the Inflation Reduction Act. I don't know if that has the right title, <laughs> but the, the IRA Inflation Reduction Act of 700. And all of a sudden it happened. So you think I'll, we could be surprised with a, a bunch of activity in, in, these, in these final 10 days? It's possible. It's possible. Right. If um, Usually they start out very ambitious in these lame ducks, and then they whittle it down to the must-pass, most mm -hmm. popular, least controversial thing so they can just get out of town. Well, Mark, uh, here's someone who um, I don't know if he's he's not getting out of town anytime soon uh, uh, or get, maybe he'll be getting out of the Bahamas being brought back to the U.S. But we talked last week. We had Ron Quanta, who kind of the town hall community appreciated like the quick overview he gave related to what occurred. So here's a here's a quote um, from John Ray, the, the CEO of FTX now in bankruptcy. Uh, he, he testified yesterday. 
And he said, you know, this is basically old fashioned embezzlement. It's taking money from customers and using it for your own purpose. So uh, Sam Bankman Freed was arrested. So that's news, obviously. Um, but what are the other things that the profession needs to be thinking about? Well, let me just mention the hearings this week. So, you know, on Monday, we were hearing that he was actually going to testify virtually in the in the Tuesday's House hearing on FTX. It was going to be him and it was going to be John Ray, uh, two separate panels. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it became fairly obvious that he wasn't going to be doing anything live or virtual because he was arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the House Financial Services Committee had a just one panel. and It was just Ray. It was just John Ray. Um, and it was interesting because there were. This week, there were two hearings, one in the House, one in the Senate, both very different. So in the House, they had Ray. Um, they, they were really focused on what specifically happened. You know, what, what, what are the facts and circumstances around what was going on at FTX? Uh, how, does, how is the bankruptcy process going to work and things like that? There were a lot of policy questions about crypto and regulation shot at him. Uh, his response to all of them, that he's responsible for the, for the bankruptcy and for getting you know, the victims uh, help them recover as much as possible. That's really where he focused. Interestingly, the way these hearings work is you can submit your oral testimony ahead of time and that it may or may not be the same with the testimony that you give bef live before you get questions from the House members or the senators. So uh, Sam Bankman Freed had actually submitted his. <laughs> so his his written testimony was there, even though he wasn't there. And I have to tell you, you know, the first three words of his testimony were I cuss word up. Uh, and so and, and if we, you look through the testimony, um, which was leaked, you, you can he takes very little responsibility. A lot of it is, well, there were no you know, there were no guardrails um, to stop me. And so I move forward and a lot of blame being cast. I don't think that's going to work going forward. The, the other hearing was in the Senate, and this was interesting. This was focused more on regulatory structure around crypto. Four, um, four witnesses, uh, AU professor Kevin Leary from Shark Tank, who is actually a paid endorser of FTX. Uh, Jennifer Schulb, who is, is a, uh, from a think tank focused on financial regulation. And then Ben Skanken. And I don't know if you're familiar, but he's a TV actor, and apparently he's been appeared on the OC, um, which I'm not aware of, but he also is, uh, writes books and does a lot of commentary on crypto. Um, that hearing was very focused on regulatory structure, what, what should have been in place regulatorily, what should have been in, in place in the United States in order to address this ever happening again. So it was more forward-looking mm -hmm. about changes we need to make to regulation the regulation of, of the crypto exchanges, you know, whether it's the FTC or the CFTC, all those questions are swirling. This conversation is going to continue, Eric. We're probably going to have a lot more to share as they figure out mm -hmm. what they're going to do. I do believe there's going to be regulation, whether it's a comprehensive package or whether they do just do some rifle shots. Unclear. There's going to be more hearings. And um, one of the things that will be interesting, though, is um, Sam's not going to be testifying. So who is it that they're going to be calling up to, to testify as they move forward? But there's definitely more to come. Yeah. And Mark, what, you know, the thing that we talked about this in the last town hall, you know, 95% of this was outside the U.S. Right. So clearly there was a lot of work done to kind of evade some of the U.S. regulatory regime. So they're going to probably, you know, do things to make sure that doesn't, doesn't happen again. And, and, and then there's also just talk about, OK, blockchain is still a good technology. Um, you know, how can we you know, th think about you know, putting in place regulation that allows the marketplace to, to leverage it? So more to come, as you said. Absolutely. We're now going to we got plenty now to talk about related to the to the IRS and some other items. And then we'll bring you back uh, for the open forum. Thanks, Mark. Lisa. Hey. OK, this was the top topic of last week. So I'll let you uh, take it away. <laughs> yeah, uh, this was a definitely a hot topic uh, lit up the the Q&A. So I wanted to come back and revisit the 1099K um, issue that we talked about. If you were not able to join us last time, um, I've given you a link to the technical update portion of the last town hall. So you can go see that to get all of the background information. 
but um, really just wanted to level set as a reminder, beginning in 2022 under legislation, under the um, ARPA that was passed in, in 2021, taxpayers who receive over $600 from an online payment processor, so that could be PayPal or Venmo and companies like that, will get a 1099K reporting the, the gross proceeds. The prior requirement was $20,000 in 200 transactions. There has been um, some push in the media um, that, that I've seen in the media to either raise that threshold somewhere between um, $5,000 and $20,000 or to delay the $600 reporting requirement but what I want to make sure we all understand it is that this is baked into the law. So the IRS doesn't have the authority to delay or change that threshold. So you just got a, a great DC update from Mark and Eric. We would be running out of time for any 1099K relief to be passed in this, in this lame duck session. And these 1099Ks are going to be due to be filed January 31. 2023. So no good news there, um, but we do want to just make sure it's on your radar. We have created a new resource center so that you can keep up to date on the latest that we're hearing in one particular spot. It's got a link to the IRS Q FAQs, which are really helpful, and I, I do recommend that you read them. Um, we've also got a J of 8 article, Tax Advisor, and we are working on some new resources that we'll have for you um, in January. So you're going to be getting a podcast with April Walker, who does our tax season um, tax section odyssey podcast. And we'll also be doing some client facing resources for you. One will be targeted at businesses and one will be targeted at um, client individual clients. Your individual clients are going to probably be confused. Why am I getting this? I've never gotten it before. They may not understand the tax law that indicates that um, even if they sold something at a loss, they are not going to be able to use that loss to offset gains unless it's a business transaction. Um, but it, so like the example that I've been using all week is if you sold Taylor Swift tickets at a, at a gain and you sold your Nickelback tickets at a loss, you're not going to be able to offset that unless you're in the business of ticket brokering. So again, we're going to be working on some resources for you and we'll be getting those out as, as soon as possible. So that's it for um, the 1099K update. But I also talked last week about revised K2, K3 draft instructions, and those were good news. So again, I wanted to just remind everyone, if you weren't on the town hall last week, that um, we got relaxed notification instructions around um, items of, of foreign tax relevance. And this is really good news, but we have um, given you a link to a journal of accountancy article so that you can go read all of the, the summary information there. Last week when I was on town hall, we didn't have the S-Corp instructions, but those have since come out and they're very similar. So um, just keeping that at the forefront as we're getting ready for busy season. We've also got um, some resources. Speaking of getting ready for busy season, I apologize for bringing it up right now, but want to give you um, some resources that I think could be helpful for you. Engagement letters will continue to be a drum that I will beat. And um, we had a, a recent Journal of Accountancy article, our professional liability spotlight that talks about do I really need an engagement letter for that? I highly recommend that you take a look at that because it's going to give you some horror stories, but also an example of how having an engagement letter and different forms of engagement letters can, can really make a difference if um, something bad happens and, and you end up getting sued. We also have a podcast that ties directly into that article with Deb Brood, who is a CNA risk consultant program specifically for the accountants program. So I highly recommend that you check that out. And then our AICPA member insurance program has provided a free resource 
for everyone, regardless of whether you're enrolled in the program. And it is a survival guide for tax season. So you're going to get a lot of good tips and some checklists that will kind of usher you through tax season. So you'll get um, before busy season, during busy season, and post tax season, get some, um, some things for you to be thinking about within your practice. I cannot let a um, town hall go by without talking about this wonderful Reimagining Your Tax Practice series that April Walker has been hosting with practitioners from firms of all sizes. If you have not checked these out, they're all available for you to watch on demand. And I'm just going to tell you all there's gold in here. I just listened, but this morning I finished listening to the one about getting to tax season zen. And regardless of where you are, and if you've got 30 years of tax season under your belt, or if you're at three years, there are some great tips from practitioners on how to kind of set yourself up for um, a successful busy season, taking time for yourself, setting boundaries, setting client minimums, setting client onboarding fees, not taking new clients during tax season, other things you can do just to move the needle. Um, that's a direct quote from, um, from that replay. So I really do encourage you to take a look at these. And again, they're available on demand. You'll get some good insights there. We have some other tax section resources available, engagement letters, client organizers, um, tax return checklists, and some practice guides. So a lot of good stuff to get you ready. So yeah. thank um, Lisa, people are loving the resources. A lot oh, of, good. A lot of shout outs, thanking you, thanking the extended teams for putting all of that together. Great. Hopefully they'll be helpful. So we now want to move to our next section where we're going to talk in, in detail about uh, the labor market related to the finance and accounting profession. So I'd like to welcome up Steve Sa, who's the executive director of finance and accounting placement at Robert Half. And he was on a town hall uh, earlier this year. So welcome, Steve. Thanks, Eric. It's good to be back on with everyone. And before we get started, I just go back to Lisa's last comment. I actually had an opportunity to watch the fourth session, the Rethinking Staffing of the On Demand series. It was fantastic. So I would just echo your comments. A lot of good resources in there. Thanks, Steve. Well, we're going to kick things off and let you, you, Robert Half, you see uh, probably in the clearest what's going on with the, the accounting and finance market. So Share us the key. Share with us your key trends. Sure. Thanks again, Eric. Um, you know, I would maybe start with just a few broad comments about the trends that we're seeing in the labor market. I, I, I must preface my comments with the fact that, unlike Marcy Russell, I'm not an economist and I don't have that crystal ball that we'd all love to have. And as we've seen, you know, not only in recent years but over the long run as well, things can certainly change quickly. You know, that said, I've been with Robert Half for nearly 25 years, and I've seen the ebbs and flows of the market over that time period, and there's no question about it. Marcy mentioned it as well. The market is still very, very competitive, and that's particularly true for accounting professionals. Um, you know, on this slide, some broad trends that I maybe just wanted to mention very quickly. While quit rates have gone down ever so slightly, they're not down significantly. And I think many employers are continuing to struggle to manage workloads and the demands of their, their businesses. Um, companies across many sectors plan to hire for newly created positions and certainly need to backfill vacated roles. You know, and then the, um, it, the, the recent optimism index that was put out by the NFIB, the National Federation for Independent Businesses, there were a few things in that report that really stood out to me when I read through it. First of all, 44% of respondents said they had job openings that they couldn't fill. And of those, 90% reported few or no qualified applicants for the positions that they're trying to staff. And then lastly, and we'll talk about this in maybe a few minutes, but I think many employers are still struggling with the retention aspect and are doing everything that they can to limit turnover really as much as possible. Maybe moving on to the next slide, um, the latest jobs report came out. Again, no question that, that jobs creation has maybe slowed a little bit and it's lower than say certainly a year ago, 
but it's still very, very solid. There were 263,000 jobs added. Unemployment levels, as, as Mar Marcy touched on, they remain near the lowest levels that we've seen in the last, what, 50 years or so, and it's been under 4% for quite some time. Probably much more relevant to all of us is the unemployment rate for college-educated professionals, and at just 2%, that essentially means and implies full employment in the market. And then when you start really digging into those numbers a little bit deeper and talk about specialty positions such as tax and audit, the effective unemployment rate for those individuals is really much closer to 1%. And so all of that to me just leads to the continued demand for top talent and the fact that those interested in looking for new roles have plenty of opportunities in front of them. The, the other report that I wanted to bring up is the job openings and labor turnover survey, which is on the next slide. It's more commonly referred to as the JOLTS report. Eric, you touched on it. Marcy touched on it. Big picture, there's still over 10 million open jobs in the United States. That number, when you step back and think about it, it's roughly about 1.7 times the number of unemployed workers and if you were to go back and look at um, that, that same ratio just prior to the recession, that rate held fairly steady for quite some time, around 1.2 times. So with the number of job openings that we have today, the demand for labor still far, far exceeds the supply that's out there. I mentioned the, the quit rate a moment ago. Um, well, again, it's decreased slightly over the past several months. We can't ignore that. I think within the accounting profession specifically, that's pretty typical for what we traditionally see around the latter half of the fourth quarter and really into the first part of the first quarter of next year, as many employees just kind of want to wait to see um, what year end bonuses look like. They want those to obviously get paid out. They want to wait and see if they're up for a potential promotion and what type of commensurate raise might come with that. They're taking very, very well-deserved time off. And as you all mentioned just a moment ago, we're starting to get into the busy season as well. So I think all those kind of really play into it. Steve, I think these, um, these numbers will not come as a surprise to most of our town hall audience, because when I'm talking to firms, um, the inability to find staff is, is one of their number one pain points, if not the number one. Yeah. Um, so I think your statistics just bear that out. There's no question about it, Lisa. And then, you know, on this slide, you see the first bullet point here. We did, we have this demand for skilled talent report, which you can find on our site at roberthalf.com. But 87% but of finance and accounting managers said it's really challenging to find skilled professionals in today's market. And then just very late yesterday afternoon, we actually released the results from our latest job optimism survey, where we go out and, and um, survey over 2,500 professionals throughout the country. Again, you can find this information on our site, but 46% of those respondents, get this, 46% said they're currently looking or plan to look for a new role in the first half of 2023. That's up from 41% just six months ago. And if you were to look back to June of 2021, that number was at 32%. So over that time period from the middle of 2021, we've seen it just steadily increase. And again, 46% of those in those surveyed said they're going to start looking um, for a new role in the first half of next year. So I think big picture, and I'd go back to Marcy's comments. I love that segment with her. I think despite what you might hear on the nightly news, the job market remains extremely healthy. Wages are continuing to grow, and that holds particularly true for accounting professionals who have a ton of options in front of them if and when they decide to look for new roles. Well, we're getting, uh, Lisa and Steve, lots of questions here on, okay, so this is good, Steve, you're know, telling us some of the things that we're well aware of. Sure. <laughs> the market is tight. So let's get, what we do here is we talk about best practices and, and strategies, so that's what we have on this slide, you know, talking about how how to kind of succeed in this market. Sure. Well, I think a couple of you know key points. I won't read through all of these bullet points, but I think the most the most important thing in a really competitive market such as what we're in is to make sure that you're making decisions quickly. And, and that doesn't mean shortcutting the process that you've determined is important to go through. 
So for example, if you determine that four people need to be involved in the interview process, that's fine, but make sure that you're not allowing those four people to string that person out over a period of three or four weeks. Have them come into the office, maybe meet all those individuals in one fell swoop, maybe use video interviewing, things like that. So in my mindset, it's not about shortcutting the process, but just moving in an expeditious fast, uh, fashion. And anything that you can do to streamline that process really puts you at a competitive advantage. The other thing um, that I would say is, well, in any competitive market, compensation is always, always, always important. I think it's really important to step back and remember that each person that you're talking to is an individual. And it's really important to step back and recognize that, that what's important to them as a person might be very different than the person that you were talking to um, earlier in the week or the one that you've got interviewing later this week or next week. And so the things that, that firms are doing that work to accommodate what a person is, is um, looking for in their next role, those are the ones that probably have the greatest likelihood of landing those individuals. Yeah, I think that is a great point. A lot of uh, people value time off over increased pay. So understanding what's important to that individual is, is key. A couple of things that we talked about last week at the digital CPA conference was cultivating a strong culture in a remote environment. And, um, you know, I, I think that's really important. We see a lot of firms who are embracing remote work, either 100% remote or a hybrid model that allows that flexibility, that autonomy to mm -hmm. let their team live their lives and, and do still do the work and still get that productivity and that excellence in, but on, the, on a different schedule than the, you know, what we've been used to in the accounting profession. Yeah, I agree, Lisa. And I think the other thing that I would add to that is, you know, the pool is so tight right now, as we've talked about, and anything that you can do to look at, consider, evaluate candidates that may be living remotely, working a hybrid type of a schedule uh, that could be in office uh, or work from home or working hours as well. That just expands that overall pool of candidate that you have to choose from. And I think that's what firms need to do in today's environment in order to be competitive and, and find the best talent that's available. Yeah, so Lisa, I know this is a slide that you're passionate about. I'll just add, you know, we had over a thousand people at Digital CPA and a lot of the leading firms are, are focusing on the things highlighted here, purpose, flexibility, value of the individual, belonging, growth. And, and there are differences. I, I talked to some firms and the talent issue is something that they're managing because of just the overall engagement of, of their employees and, and their ability to kind of really tell the story to, to new recruits. Yeah. And, you know, Eric, as, as you and Steve and I were, were talking over the best practices that he'd outlined, that's why this slide came to mind. I've been using it a lot the last few months because I just feel like in terms of a people first business model, which is, is what I'm hearing with so many firms these days, they're, they're really trying to focus in on what, what their people need because happier um, professionals are gonna deliver quality service and, and client customer satisfaction. So I thought this was just a good way to kind of summarize what um, Steve had been pulling out, but we'll give you some specific example. So a lot of people want to know that the work they do has meaning and that is embedded in our profession, helping with entrepreneurs who are um, trying to get their American dream going, helping nonprofits meet their purpose and their mission. So, so much of this ties directly in to the accounting profession. And I thought it was a great way to uh, summarize our conversation today. Yeah, a lot of the, the other thing that I would add to that is a lot of the things that firms are doing to talk about, you know, their DE and I initiatives, um, developing organizational culture. Those are the things that can really resonate with a person. And I think it's extremely important to make sure that you're talking about that during the interviewing process, because if that's what that if that's what that person is looking for, if they want that type of an environment, that can be the difference between them taking the job with company B as opposed to company A or C. 
And so the more you're um, bringing those things up and discussing them during the interviewing process, the more it really resonates. Agreed. Well, thanks. Thanks, Steve. We're now going to move uh, into open forum, bring Mark up. Uh, lots of questions. Uh, Lisa, I think uh, in 1099K, uh, again, is, uh, is, is, is lead, leading the way. One thing, you know, question about all this information that's been provided by the PayPal's, Venmo's, the Zell's, how are they going to differentiate uh, from people just paying each other back versus, you know, paying uh, somebody to do work? It's a great question. And um, to clarify, it's my understanding that Zelle is not currently part of this network that is going to be required to report the, under these new thresholds. But um, it's my understanding that if, um, if, if you're transferring money through Venmo to reimburse someone for you, you split lunch or you split, split concert tickets, then you would mark that as personal. But otherwise, if, if you're um, transacting business, then the transaction would be marked as a business um, transaction and then get reported that way. But um, if it's anything like my son who has a little side hustle, he's not keeping records on all that. So I know what I'm going to be talking to him about over the holiday. Well, I mean, and one thing it's, this is, it's, you know, people need to report their income and we we've had some sessions uh, with some of the people in Europe are on making tax digital in many ways, they're ahead of us, Mark here. So this isn't going away. This is just, you know, the government's going to get more digital information on what's going on and people, and that's, they want to make up the tax cap. No, that's absolutely right. And you add that to all of the, the money that the IRS got for enforcement. Um, it's going to get a lot of attention. 1099K is as well. I mean, there were whispers of it potentially in this year on end deal, but Lisa managed expectations appropriately. I think it's it's a long shot. But what that indicates is Congress knows it's a problem. And so I think if there's a if there's a little silver lining in that, that it's not getting fixed tomorrow, is that they're they're starting to hear and figure out what an issue this is going to be. And this is going to be this is we are educating the Hill, but it's going to the the blowback from their constituents is going to surprise them. Right. And we're seeing a lot. We're, we're going to get resources out. You see resources being provided uh, by others into it, h and block, just the broader marketplace. So there's, there's a lot of discussion around this. So Mark uh, and Steve, thank you. We've, we've got a couple of important resources that we want to highlight, uh, but look forward to having you both on a, on a future town hall. So Lisa, we're going to close things out. Here's our in summary. It's, it's actually hard sometimes to put together the in summary slide because there is so much uh, that we cover on, on a weekly basis but please leverage that. We try to put these slides together in a way that you can leverage them for other members of your firm and, and your clients. Here's the recent town hall series, uh, the archive. Lisa, you're, you're, you're giving them something fun to do. Absolutely. So we talked about um, lowering the stress during busy season. And this is one of our most popular resources within PCPS. It is available to AICPA members. So this is an inspiration tool for you to download a, a Word document, put your firm's logo on it, and start having some fun. And as a reminder, don't forget those remote employees. They want to have fun too. We've got this important benchmark survey that was released last week. I encourage you to take a look at this. This is for client advisory services, one of the highest growth, area, growth areas. It shows that the top performers almost have double the net professional fees of the average performers. So there's a lot of ways where people are building, you know, a lot of intentional strategies that firms are putting in place to build greater success. So that's highlighted here in this CAS benchmark survey. And we're going to have a webinar on January 17th where we unpack this further. We also are uh, releasing this new AICPA town hall portal, uh, which will give you, you know, different ways to leverage the information that we cover on a weekly basis, uh, resources to download. It will highlight the newsletters, um, ability for you to provide us additional feedback. We love feedback, uh, topic speaker ideas, uh, and access to the, to the archives. So Lisa, that brings us to the close of 2022. We'll be back with them. You and I will be together. We're going to do uh, uh, another uh, live session in person, both of us on January 5th with Barry Melanson and others. 
but it's just been great. Great working with you, Lisa, on this over the past three years, being with the, the community. I'll let you close, close things out today. I'm going to close with a shout out to all the people you don't get to see who are working so hard to bring this town hall to you and to create that new portal and to continue to upgrade your experience. So thank you to everyone behind the scenes and to, to our town hall attendees. Please um, enjoy the holiday season. Take some time to unplug and rest. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.